Lancaster here. I'm just going to introduce um, the moderator for this evening, who will then introduce the speakers. Um, this is um, several of us are involved in, in uh, the organizing this. Um, others I wanted to thank are Luke O'Brien and Omar Dabur, who will be moderating, and Richard Wolin. Um, we're very pleased to have a loyal cohort of student fellows who have come, and which is great, um, and some faculty who have been attending um, regularly, so uh, that's terrific. Um, John McMahon, our videographer, is immensely talented in both that regard and as an, uh, an assistant on the grant. And uh, you can find the videos um, online and both YouTube and through the Mel and Sawyer website, which is also very interesting and has a bunch of links and bibliography for those who want to follow up on our general theme of democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. Um, Adam Edinson has been our, um, our postdoc and has organized reading groups. And um, Josh Keaton and Adam McMahon have been wonderful research assistants to us. So thanks to all those people. As usual, we have our fan super fantastic reception that follows uh, the entire um, proceedings. And you'll have a good chance to, um, to talk specifically with uh, both speakers there. We have wine, cheese, and all kinds of goodies to eat <coughs> and drink. Um, and um, I'm especially delighted to have such distinguished speakers, both of whom I count as old friends. Um, I've known Akio for quite a while, and uh, the specifics of his work will be uh, introduced by Omar. But it's just a real delight to have have you come uh, and talk as part of our um, lead speaker today. And also, Dave was it known for decades. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that. I explained him as my, my student uh, when I was teaching at Swarthmore. And he was a star honor student in political philosophy. Uh, so it's just great to have, um, to have uh, both speakers here. And I'm now going to turn this over to Omar Dabur, who will moderate the discussion. Thanks, Carol. Um, I'm going to be relatively short, but I do want to um, welcome our speakers and uh, just point out to you that this is a somewhat rare treat for people who are interested in cultural difference and democratic governance because we have here both two distinguished and uh, noted philosophers and political theorists, but also two who have both scholarly and personal connections to the, um, the South Asia and the Indian subcontinent, which is probably the main venue for uh, discussions about this complex of issues outside the North Atlantic world, uh, and as you know, classically India is considered the, the largest uh, purported democracy. I'll stick the word purported in there, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, so let me just say uh, a word about uh, both of them quickly, and then um, Akhil has this wonderfully fascinating but wonderfully long paper, so I want to give him the maximum amount of time. So uh, Akhil Belgrami is a um, Johnsonian professor of philosophy at Columbia University. Uh, he has um, held a number of other positions there, including um, chair of the philosophy department. I believe he was one of the founding members of this very interesting initiative, which they have called the Committee on Global Thought. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, also was director of the uh, Humanities Center for uh, some time uh, at Columbia. So he's played uh, a, a larger than usual role for philosophers within the university and within uh, the research world um, generally. Let me just mention uh, some of his publications because it shows, it shows his range. He began uh, with his book, Belief and Meaning, in 1992, um, moving on from philosophy of language uh, in 2006 to uh, his second book, as far as I know, Self-Knowledge and Resentment, and then most recently, um, forthcoming or perhaps already out, I'm not sure, Politics and the Moral Psychology of Identity. And I'm, I hear that he's got two more books in the works. One is a, a book called, I think it's still called, What is a Muslim? And another book untitled, I think so far, on um, Gandhi. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing both of those. Um, Uday is probably known to many of you. Uh, he is a distinguished professor in the PhD program in political science and uh, began his work on uh, somewhat differently from Akhil, uh, his first book published at Tux about the same time, uh, The Anxiety of Freedom, Imagination and Individuality in the Political Thought of John Locke. 
Uh, and then, of course, many of you will know his second book, Liberalism and Empire, which was uh, published in 2000, which was um, uh, a very interesting book for many of us in, in a lot of ways. Uh, he's now uh, currently working on uh, a work on war, peace, and nonviolence, which I believe also, uh, another point of connection, has uh, a bit of uh, consideration of Gandhi as well. So um, I'd like to then uh, turn to Akhil uh, without further ado. Is uh, the latest iteration of the paper, I believe, is entitled Liberalism and Relativism in the Face uh, of Identity Politics. Thank you, Amara. Thank you, Karen, for asking me. It's very nice to be here. Is it um, on or is it on? It's it might seem on. Is, is, it, is it not on? It's not on. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to bring together some of my interests in practical reason um, and, and rationality uh, in, in the practical sphere and uh, apply it to issues of politics. I'm going to begin with practical reason and and what is sometimes called moral psychology by philosophers. And part of my intellectual motivation here is to shift the focus of discussion of liberalism and issues of identity away from the standard uh, disputation, uh, which has mostly been defined in the last three decades in terms of communitarianism and liberalism to the underlying issues in moral psychology. Uh, the standard disputes between the, uh, liberalism and communitarianism will not be far from the surface, but, but the idea is to dig, but this is a tendentious word, deeper uh, than the uh, merely uh, political uh, issues and look at some of the issues concerning reason and motivation that underlie uh, those more familiar debates. So let me begin with moral psychology and issues of rationality, individual rationality, and, and then work up to two questions of politics. I should just say as another caveat that I will not be talking <coughs> really about identity politics, but the concept of identity. And identity politics, of course, has to do with the concept of identity, but it is so contaminated by, by just political manipulations of groups and political parties and so on that you know, it's come to have a, a bad reputation. And I'm not interested in, in, those, uh, in, in, the, in the miring of the concept of identity in day-to-day in -day politics. I'm really interested in the concept of identity and why basic liberal ideas uh, find it so hard to, to cope with, uh, with the concept of identity. It seems to me that the real difficulty that liberalism has in coping with the concept of identity has got to do with an, an intellectual outlook that underlies liberalism and a, an intellectual outlook that underlies the appeal of identity in politics. And that's what I want to try and bring to the surface through a study of moral psychology. So what I'm going to do is start at some distance from politics and define for you, or characterize for you, uh, some notions which I'm going to exploit. Long uh, long ago, but some decades ago, Bernard Williams wrote this very brilliant, a very careless essay, but very brilliant essay, called Internal versus External Reasons. And, and basically his idea was that a certain kind of uh, externalism about rationality, uh, Kant was one of his targets, but other doctrines too, uh, was was at its heart uh, untenable, and that really there was no other 
kind of rationality uh, in general that I'm going to focus just on in the political sphere uh, than internal rationality. And the idea of internal rationality, which I'm not going to spell out uh, now, is basically the idea that you can't um, detach the idea of something being a reason for you to do something from your motivation. That is, you, it, something can't be a reason for you unless it speaks in some way to what is already motivates you. Uh, and, uh, or as part of your motivational economy, if you like. Um, and uh, so if you don't in some way recognize it as something that uh, prompts your motivations, it can't be a reason for you. It can't be some external uh, grounds for you to do something must also appeal to you internally. Now, I'm not going to spell this out in, in any detail, but what I'm going to try and do with my first set of remarks is to answer a question which Christine Koskar asks in a general way about normativity. What is the source of something being an internal reason for you? That is, what kind of thing what kind of relations between your thoughts and your states of mind are such that they provide internal reasons, reasons that are part of your internal psychological economy, motivational economy. So what is the source of it? It's, well, what are the relations between your states of mind that induce a form of rationality, which is internal rationality? So that's the question I'm going to ask first. And I've argued in other places, in places, uh, some publications of mine, that there is a notion of relations between one's motivational states of mind, desires, <coughs> preferences, subjective utilities, these are roughly synonyms for people in different disciplines. Um, they're, they're terms in different disciplines, but can be treated roughly synonymously for the purposes of this talk. Uh, what are the relations between motivational states of mind, like preferences and uh, subjective utility, <coughs> or displayed desires to use human stem, um, such that they were they to fulfill these relations, uh, which I'm going to try and characterize, they will amount to a person having an internal rationality of the kind that Williams seeks to uh, elaborate. So, so what I'd like to, to do is to present to you my, my first notion, which is, a, which is the notion of a set of rationality-inducing relations between motivational states of mind, uh, which, which are the sources of internal normativity or rationality. Okay. And, and in some of my writing, I've called this uh, the idea of reinforcement. That is, there's a relation between our desires, if you like, let's just use the term desires, which is reinforcement. Now, I don't really like the word reinforcement that much because it suggests a kind of hydraulic or causal relation between them. That's not the point. The point is it's a rationality inducing. It's, it's sort of rational support for each other. But reinforcement, if you can, if you can let go of the, the hydraulic impression it gives, uh, 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 reinforcement, I think, is, is perfectly satisfactory term. So here's, here's, I'm going to give you, uh, uh, some of you have heard this, I'm sorry, but, uh, but I'm going to give you through uh, two pairs of, of desires and a contrast between them, we're going to give you an intuitive sense of what I mean by this rationality-inducing relation of reinforcement between <coughs> uh, states of mind, uh, motivational states of mind. So in the paper, the example I, I gave is between two pairs of desires, in, let's call them, uh, my desire, and this is my psychological my desire that I pursue philosophy. <coughs> and my desire 
that I the uh, team I covered later in the world. Each morning when I get up, <coughs> and a second set of desires, a second pair of desires. Myself here that I uh, use my father. <coughs> I, I, sh I should tell you that my father was uh, a sort of intellectual, he was a judge, and he wanted me to be uh, promptly uh, pursue a life of the mind. Um, all right, so, so there are two pairs of designs here, and, and I claim that uh, this, the standard relation between states of mind, even motivational states of mind, which of course induces rationality or, or is required for rationality, is consistent. Uh, so that's standard, that's, that's like, What's the opposite of original sin? Original virtue. That's the original virtue. Right? You, you just have to have that, otherwise you don't have anything. All right, so, uh, so, so consistency it goes without sin. It's not interesting, but it's a basic as a uh, In my case, these are both consistent. But now consistency is not a very interesting uh, re relation because all it means, all it amounts to, in, in, in practical life is that the two desires should be mutually implemented. That's, that's really all that consistency amounts to. And these, in my case, are mutually implementable, and so are these. So they satisfy that uh, desideratum. If that were all there is to, uh, to rationality of, uh, within one's mind, it would be, it, it would be very uninteresting and it wouldn't be very hard to actually achieve. Um, so, so what I want you to do is to pay attention to this and, and take in what I think to be an absolutely elementary observation here, that the second pair of desires has more than consistency. Whereas the first pair of desires has mere consistency. Now, what that more is, is something we need a name for. I wanted to suggest it's reinforcement. But it may well be that uh, when you say something like that, there's a whole infantry of humans and others who, who say, well, Yes, the second, the second pair of, of desires has something more to do with uh, each other than the first. The first, just independent of each other, mutually implementable. But the second pair of desires, you can see, has something more to do with each other. And they say, well, you're saying nothing different or new here because, you know, it's, this is very much part of the whole human uh, ideal of rationality. Uh, the second pair of desires stand in a relationship of instrumentality, that is, uh, a means end uh, relation between one another. And this was very much part of Hume's understanding of uh, uh, motivation of rationality, Hume means end rationality. So, what is my response? Since I'm claiming that I'm, I'm saying something slightly different from you, uh, what, 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 how do I respond to that? Well, I ask myself, what could people mean, what does you and humans mean, by the idea of uh, instrumentality as a relation between two preferences? What, what would instru instrumentality amount to? Now, this is the only thing I think I can come up with characterize what instrumentality is. Instrumentality between two preferences 
is the idea that you pursue one preference or desire in order to pursue the other. That, that you try and fulfill one desire in order to fulfill the other desire. I don't know what else instrumentality could possibly mean. As a relation between, within your intentionality, right, within your psychology, you're talking about, about uh, rationality here, so we're not talking about the facts, but how I think of it. And how I think of it, if I'm thinking of, of my preferences as related by instrumentalities, that I pursue the one in order to pursue the other. Okay, if that's what instrumentality is, then the idea will have to be that I pursue. So this does not have that, because this is just merely consistent. But my claim that this has a further relation has to do with, the question is, does it have to do with instrumentality? If it does, then the idea would have to be that I pursue this, and you know the facts about my father, etc. now, and I pursue this in order to pursue this. Right. Well, let me tell you that I don't. I just don't. I mean, you just have to take my word for it. Uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, the, uh, things about your father, you may think there's a lot of self-deception about it, but just take my word for it, it's not true. I mean, if you don't like the example, come up with another example. That is, it does, I can tell you quite honestly, that I, I have both those desires, or I have them, my father's dead now, I had them, and I did not pursue the first in order to pursue the second. So it's not an instrumental tradition. Nevertheless, this is different from this, because these two desires have something more to do with each other. What is that relation that the second bear has, given that it's not instrumentality? And I'm calling that reinforcement. That, that's the idea. Now, you know, you can say, well, but as a matter of fact, the pursuit of the one would give rise to the other. That's not interesting. Facts are not what we're interested in. We're interested in my psychology, in my intentionality. That's the only thing that instrumentality is relevant to, because that's my subject. I'm not interested in what, as a matter of fact, is instrumental to us all. But whether it's part of my rationality and intentionality that it is, and it isn't. So I'm claiming that within my intentionality and psychological economy, there's a relation which is not consistency, I mean, which is over and above consistency, and is not instrumentality. And I'm just baptizing that reinforcement. Not ideal term, but you can find another name for it. Okay? So, so that, I'm claiming, is, goes very deep in understanding internal rationality. It's the most interesting source of what, of what Bernard Williams calls inter internal reasons or internal rationality. It's pervasive in understanding one's motivational psychological economy. And, and, I'm, uh, uh, and I want to say its, it's relevance to politics is enormous because a lot of reason giving in politics, a lot of, of, of social dialectics in politics depends on finding people to be wrong or irrational, but people are not irrational in the simple sense of being straightforwardly in, inconsistent. Right? They're, they're irrational in very subtle ways, and those ways would be the opposite of reinforced. That is, if their states of mind motivational states of mind are such that they have the opposite of reinforcement. I don't know what to call it. So, so you can, you, if the, so, so many preferences where they're not reinforced or the opposite of reinforced infirm each other. They don't reinform each other, uh, reinforce each other, but they, in some sense, infirm each other. It's not inconsistent. It's a kind of 
if you like, dissonance. It's a, it's a dissonance between one state's of mind. And so over and above consistency and inconsistency, there is reinforcement and infirmity between, uh, between one's uh, motivation states of mind, I'm claiming. And it's extremely important in, in the relations between groups and uh, individual human beings that the, the dialectic by which people argue with one another, change each other's minds, or change their own minds, uh, and so on, is through a deliberation by noticing internal, not inconsistencies, but internal tensions, and then deliberating one's way out of them. And this is extremely important for politics. Uh, because, because if politics is to involve rationality, this is what we have to identify first. So that's the first link between moral psychology and politics, to, to identify this, this set of relations in, within the mind. Uh, OK, so, so that's one concept. Now, a second concept is, is something that I have simply taken from Aristotle, Aquinas, and cast of characters going down to Donald Davidson and others, which is just weakness of will. And I, I'm just going to, given what I've said, I'm going to characterize weakness of will as the idea that somebody is weak willed if all of their reinforced motivational states point to them doing some action, say X, but they end up not doing X or doing Y, say. Right? So if, if my psychological economy has it that reinforcement between my preferences suggests that I should do a particular action, but I do some action which is not well reinforced instead. That's being weak willed. Okay? So a lot of my desires are in coherence. It's kind of reinforcement is a kind of notion of coherence. It's not about beliefs but desires. And and if I do the opposite, that's to be weak willed. Okay? That's that's how I'm characterizing weak willed. And this is not this is not uh, Aristotle's idea, but it's Aristotle's basic structures there, I'm just fitting it in with notion of reinforcement as, as the guiding notion. Okay, so, so that's weakness of will. So, and finally, I want to, to characterize in moral psychological terms, not uh, standard communitarian terms and so on, the idea of identity. Now, in a lot of my work, I've been uh, asking, what is the moral psychology of identity? And, uh, you know, the, this, this sort of, the concept of identity is thrown around with such profligacy uh, in, in politics. And so for some time now, I've been trying to ask, well, can we say anything more rigorous and, and detailed about it? And, uh, and when I read Jan Elster's book, Ulysses and the Sirens, um, uh, which I read relatively late, actually, that, and by the way, Elster, with whom I teach a graduate seminar every fall, um, uh, completely disagrees with my use of this notion to characterize identity. But he's just wrong about this. Um, <laughs> this is how I, I uh, uh, use the idea of Ulysses and the Sirens to to define what identity is. In the common parlance, the idea of identity is the idea of, that underlies people saying things like, so E.M. Forster said, I wouldn't recognize myself if I, this is just British schoolboy ideas of identity, uh, I wouldn't recognize myself if I snitched on my friends. It's fine to snitch on your country, he was supporting the people who defect to Russia and so on. This is Cambridge in the 1930s, I guess. And he said, but I would, I would, uh, I just couldn't recognize myself if I snitched on my friends. Well, that's the idea of identity. I mean, I'm so deeply committed to certain things. So, British schoolboys, don't snitch on your friends, central flag. Uh, 
So I'm so deeply committed to friendship, or something like that, that it defines me. It's my identity. That, that's, that's the basic idea. And then you can transfer it to race and gender and ethnicity, etc. I'm so deeply committed to, to being African American, or being Indian, etc. <coughs> Well, this is, this is just a very loose way of talking. I couldn't recognize myself to that. So, so here's how I've tried to elaborate that sort of intuitive uh, idea of you know, authenticity, or whatever you'd like to. Philosophers have had different terms for it. So I've defined it in terms of, of Ulysses and the Silence. Uh, and I came to that thought when I first read something by Ayatollah Khomeini, but, but I'll come to that. But let me give you a very abstract idea of, of um, what, what I mean by uh, using Ulysses in the silence to characterize identity. My thought is that if I feel so deeply committed to something that I find, but let, let me put it very abstractly, that that I'm so committed to it that I would be committed to it even if I were, counterfactually, to be not committed. Now this doesn't really make much sense, prima facie. So, so you've got to index it to times. And believe it or not, Ayatollah Khomeini indexed it to times in, in a famous statement of his. So this is the Ayatollah's version of the Pope's encyclical, uh, which is, this is, modernity is so pernicious, it is so pervasive and contagious that it will no doubt affect us, he says in this statement, and, and we should guard against it in such a way that were we to weak in the future and cease to have Islamic values, we would have entrenched ourselves in such a way that we live by Islamic values even if in the future we had weakened and given up Islamic values. So we should now entrench ourselves in society with the values of Islam in such a way that were we to weaken in the future, we would still be living by it. And that's Ulysses at the side. Such a deep commitment to Penelope, chastity, whatever, that I know that I will weaken when the silent sing, tie myself to the mast. So, right, so, so the reason why I characterize identity in this way is that it shows you how deeply committed you are to something, that you think that if you were to change your mind, it would be a form of weakness. And so you tie yourself to it, this is just criticism, sorry, such that in the future were you to change your mind, you would be living by what you in the present have, think is so deeply to be valued, preferred, desired, etc. So when a desire or preference is held with this kind of commitment, when it's held with this kind of commitment, it goes so deep that it constitutes your identity. So these preferences are identity imparting preferences, held in this looped sort of form that, that Ulysses in the silence form holding. Okay? So identity is therefore to be characterized along these lines. Now remember, it's, it's what I like about this, I, I don't mean that in a self congratulatory way, what I mean, what, what, I, what I like about this notion of identity is that it isn't essentialist. It doesn't tell you you are essentially this kind of person because it allows you to change your mind. It's just that you think of mind changes as weakening. But you don't, it doesn't say you can't change your mind. It sees people as highly mutable in their commitments. It's just that you, at time T1, you have a certain identity. If you hold certain preferences in such a way that you claim that at time Tn, if you didn't have those preferences, you would nevertheless be living by them at time Tn. Right. 
So, you, so it allows for revisability, it allows for change, etc. It just doesn't allow for you to think well of the revision, right? And that's what your identity consists in. That's how deeply committed you are to these things. And it's depth of commitment, which, which is what motivates you and mobilizes you in politics. I feel so strongly about being black, Canadian, or French speaking, or and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so these are the three notions in moral psychology that are the backdrop of my interest in politics. So, now to politics. Uh, to liberal politics. And, and in liberalism, there is this view, which I think is just the, I mean, if you're not, if you don't believe this, you're not a liberal. It's just defining your liberalism. Uh, and the view is, you, when you, uh, when you value something, uh, you, th this ordinary values are to be treated as extraordinary if you are a liberal. And, you know, there's some marginal differences between the values that liberals are committed to, but certainly the one that all liberals are committed to is something like free speech. The first liberty. The, the, the first principle in draws, for instance, the basic liberties, free speech, and other things like that. I mean, that's the hallmark. You know, whether you adopt Rawls' a second principle, well, depends on whether you're a New Deal liberal or not. Rawls was basically consolidating New, uh, new Deal uh, political positions in his second principle. But the first principle, every liberal uh, uh, has to subscribe to, basic liberties. So let's focus on free speech. And what makes something uh, uh, a basic principle of that kind uh, has a very interesting standard formulation, uh, which is this. Uh, individuals, individuals, citizens, must be uh, left Unimpeded to pursue their uh, well, substantive values or conceptions of the good life is uh, and these are just substances, you know, substantive values. Uh, Islam, Christianity. Socialism. Um, so, and the, what defines liberalism? I mean, you can't call yourself a liberal. I mean, this uh, is really just too basic. Uh, you can't call yourself a liberal unless you notice the following thing about the slope, and that is that this idea here. This value here cannot be weighed on the same scale as this one. So in some sense, I'm a liberal in this sense that's very recognizable by the end of my overall thinking on the subject. But this much I subscribe to, and therefore I think I subscribe to what is the absolute heart of liberalism, which is that we have here a value being un you know, non-interference, right? a kind of freedom, the first liberty in Rawls, the first principle of liberty. You simply cannot weigh this on the same scale as these values, substantive values that you have to, to uh, whatever it might be, uh, you know, uh, playing cricket. Um, <laughs> And, uh, or as you grow older, merely watching it. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, let's say socialism, something like that. So these are substantive values you have. And uh, 
They can't be, if you're a liberal, you can't say, well, it's all one mix, and you, you, you know, there's free speech or non-interference, and there's socialism and so on. Uh, there's something more basic about these. You can't weigh them on the same scale. And there's been a whole endless literature of what makes them the, unim the idea of being unimpeded special, where people talk of trumps and so on and so forth. It's a very standard literature. But the main thing, you can't be a liberal if you don't believe, is that they, they, have to be made, they can't be made on the same scale at all. Right? Now, I think that's right. I, I, I actually do subscribe to, to that view. You can't get rid of believe that. And so, once you acknowledge that, you then notice that what a standard orthodox line of liberalism believes is not merely that innocuous and uncontroversial claim for a liberal, that, uh, that non-interference can't be weighed on the same scale as the substantive values, but they say something different, much stronger, which is that you can't, not merely can't you, not merely must they be weighed on, on, on different scales, but there is, and this is the, their point, you can't uh, justify, sorry, you can't justify non-interference by appeal to anything there. That's really, in a way, uh, a, a kind of commitment to external reasons, but you know, I don't want to bring in moral psychology so early in the game. That's that's just the the idea is that you can't justify non-interference, the special and elevated value, by appeal to to these other things. That's a completely different claim than that they can't be weighed on the same scale. And you really have to register that these are two different things to say. Because it's perfectly possible to say one is special, can't be weighed on the same scale, but can only be justified by appealing to substantive values. Right? So, so those are two different claims, and the second claim adds to liberalism and makes it the absolutely standard line of liberalism. Now, I don't have the time to, to discuss a whole tradition of thinking about this, which comes really, gets its flowering in, uh, in Mill and Mill's fallibilism. See, Mill's idea is that you can establish that non-interference or, or liberty of speech or discussion, as he says, is, is, can be justified. I mean, one strand in Mill says you can justify it without appeal to any substantive values. And that's the famous meta-inductive argument. I've been wrong in the past, I could be wrong now, therefore I must tolerate dissent from uh, my current opinions. But that famous meta-inductive argument is based basically on Akati's in epistemology, which says we can always be wrong in the views we currently hold, so we must listen to dissenting views and tolerate them. That's the basis for free speech. That argument depends on no substantive values. All you have to be capable of is inductive rationality to see the force of that argument. It just is based on an induction. We've been wrong in the past, therefore we may be wrong now. So we must tolerate dissent. So all you require is... Now, in, in the paper that, that Uday and others have just read for this, there are some substantive considerations that are involved, such as the pursuit of truth, because remember the idea in Mill is you pursue the truth more successfully if you tolerate dissent. So truth has to be a goal in some way or a value uh, uh, in order to do this. But truth is a cognitive goal. It's not a it's not a moral goal or a political goal and so on. So uh, and actually I think I think the argument that this argument by the way is subscribed to by so many people. You put this meta-inductive argument to people Everybody seems to subscribe to it. I think it's an absolutely numbing fallacy. But a lot of people uh, accept it, and all you have to do is to consider pragmatist epistemology to understand how deep a fallacy it is. Because it's basically based on Cartesian fallibilism. Um, and the idea 
that liberalism should depend on an absolutely non-credible epistemology, like Descartes, is bizarre. Uh, but it's very much part of the tradition. I'm not going to actually get into that. It's just too difficult to raise all the epistemological issues involved. We could discuss it. But I'm going to, what I'm going to do is to very quickly transpose the idea of fallibility to politics. And, you know, it's really done by Rawls. Rawls argues in his, uh, in, a, in a combination of two things, the theory of justice and his constructivism lectures, uh, basically lectures on Kant, uh, on Kantian constructivism. Rawls argues, gives the following argument, uh, which is really very uh, interesting because it takes over from Mill and transposes Mill's ideals about the uh, argument for liberty onto a contractualist model. And here's the argument. So Rawls, as we know, in the theory of justice, has this basic argument for the first principle, which is the principle of liberty, free speech being the primary one. The basic argument of all of theory of justice is, as you all know, so I'll just say it quickly, the, the, the basic idea behind the theory of justice is to come up with a method such that it will deliver for you principles to live by, values to live by, which are not biased in your favor. That's the basic motivation of the theory of justice, That's what justice as fairness is. It's the underlying goal of the project, the noble project, come up with a method, apply the method, deliver principles of values to live by which are not biased in your own favor. Now, this method, as you know, is the method in which you're not supposed to know these values. You don't know your place in life, you don't know what you substantively value, etc. And the idea is that if you, if you sign on to the first principle of liberty, you sign on to this without appealing to any of this. But that is what I'm calling the standard argument for liberalism. It just is a transposition of Mill's argument for liberty, appealing to fallibilism, onto an uh, intercontractual scenario. I'll, that'll come through in just a moment. So, so that's the, the point of the theory of justice. And as soon as he said it, a ton of bricks were visited upon him. You know, about the dark people in this department, and uh, maybe Carol did it, and Stephen Dukes wrote, uh, if I remember, wrote the first review of, famous review of Rawls, and Sandel uh, went out to dinner every night on uh, uh, Stephen Dukes' criticism of Rawls. Um, it's perfectly all right, that's what students do with their teachers' um, ideas. And so uh, the, the, the criticism that came in, just about everybody descended on, on poor Rawls and said, what nonsense? You, you're suggesting the following scenario. Rawls' scenario is, here's a method which will deliver principles to live by which are not biased in your own favor. Hide from yourself all these commitments of yours and you will choose the principle of liberty, the first principle. How will you do this? Well, here's the instruction Rawls gives. He says, if, when you don't know these, veil of ignorance, etc., if you don't know these things and you're behind the veil of ignorance, you're allowed to imagine all the possible things that you might end up being once the veil is lifted, that you might find yourself out to be. Right? And he says, no matter what you imagine, this is the risk averse element in the method, no matter what you imagine, you'll end up being, you would choose these principles, the first principle being that non-interference. So the instruction is, imagine yourself to be this, that, and the other, and no matter what you imagine, you will choose this principle. That's the risk of our sediment in it. And all the critics said, what nonsense. If I imagine myself to be a fanatical Muslim or Christian or whatever, I'm certainly not going to choose uh, free speech. Yeah. You imagine, uh, imagine somebody writes a book, uh, some, some Greek 
uh, in Pertinent Greek novelist writes a book about Christ being on the cross and having sexual fantasies. This is cousin uh, <clears throat> You can see why somebody would want to ban it. I mean, I would certainly want to ban such a book um, if I imagine myself to be you know, a devout Christian. So, so what is he talking about? That no matter what you imagine yourself to be, I mean, lots of things I can imagine, but I would not subscribe to the first principle. And Rawls <coughs> responds in the constructivism lectures and says, you haven't understood the first thing I've said. Which is, and which is, uh, he says, just read theory of justice. It's an essential part of the theory of justice. It just becomes more explicit in the in the Kantian constructivism lectures. And he says, look, behind the veil of ignorance, it's not part of the method by which uh, uh, fair principles are to live. You're uh, behind. You're certainly allowed to know general truths about yourself. You just don't know substantive, uh, particular commitments you have. What general truths do you know? And he states that. And he says some are general principles of moral psychology. That's Rawls's view. And one of them is that we know as human beings that we change our values. We revise our values. So he, <coughs> he takes from Mill the idea of fallibility. He just calls it <coughs> revisability. And he says it's just an essential part of being a human being, that we change our values. So he's not talking about truth, etc. He's really talking about values. That's another change. But he's also situating it in a contractual scenario. So he says, well, if I know that, I, that I'm the sort of person who changes my values, then he says, I will surely want to protect my future values. And so I will subscribe to the principle of liberty after all. So even if I imagine myself to be a devout Christian, etc., right, I will still choose free speech because I may end up having Kazan Saki's views or something, you know, or Salman Rushdie's views and so on. Right? So I would still protect my, uh, uh, want my free speech protected. So he says, once you understand that human beings know themselves to change their minds, etc., they are going to choose free speech after all. So the, so the argument from Luke's and so on just won't work, says Rawls in the constructivism lectures. Okay, that's the transposition of men. Fallibility gets changed to reversibility in a contractual scenario. You can always change your mind, and you know that about yourself, and it applies to values rather than about truths and so on. Right? Um, okay, that's that's the right. So here is what is seems to me to be the flaw, nothing to do with how he leaves out the fact that we have deep communitarian senses of belonging and so on and so forth. Well that may be true, but this is much more abstract and general point that, that's around with Rawls is that if you followed his argument so far, which is in its way an impressive argument, it's not easy to. I'm now going to apply my three moral psychological concepts to this argument and the state of play we are now in vis-a-vis this argument. And that is that just start with this. Now, I characterize deep commitments of identity as involving the Ulysses and the Sirens moral psychology. Right? Now what does Ulysses and the Sirens say? It says, I care for my current values so much that I want to protect them against future changes of mind. That's tying yourself to the last. And Rubble says, you might change your mind, so you should take out an insurance policy for your future states of mind against the current. That's the real impasse between the moral psychology of liberalism and the moral psychology of identity. That if you are a liberal, I think Rawls, 
Ron says, just tapping what Mill says, if you are a liberal, you are going to stress. You're always going to want to take out an insurance policy for your future views, future values, against the present. That's the con commitment to rationality for liberalism. But the conception of rationality for the identitarian is the opposite. You take out an insurance policy for the present that's how deep your identity is, of your commitment to the time T1. That's where you define identity, time T1. Right. And you're so deeply committed to it that you want to protect it from future changes about you know, half, half its Russian prince, and so on and so forth. Ulysses, and silence, etc. So, so that's the real impasse. It's not community. I mean, you know, community versus, versus individual and so on and so forth is fine. All those things are certainly deep, interesting things to say. But this, I believe, is the underlying moral psychology of the dispute, which is that it's an essential part of liberalism in the standard understanding of it, which requires you in this way given fallibilism or reversibility, etc., to take out an insurance policy for your future views, just in case you change your mind, against the present. Whereas identity politics requires you to take out an insurance policy for you, because that's what defines your identity at time two. Now, the story isn't quite over yet, because it's perfectly possible for somebody to come back say, well, all you've shown is that there's an impasse between these two views. Right? And, and, and it's true, there is this impasse between these two views. But in fact, the liberal is on, on worse ground than the identitarian, unless the liberal works much harder than, than I believe he or she has hitherto done. Uh, and I think you may have to transform yourself in some very radical ways if you were to do that. But you see, it's the, it, when it comes to this impasse, the, the identitarian always wins. Why? Because suppose the person behind the veil of ignorance doesn't merely believe in Christianity or Islam or whatever it is, devoutly, and believe it in this identitarian mode of Ulysses and the Sirens. But imagine that it's not merely that he believes in it along these lines, but also that that commitment to, say, Christianity, devout Christianity, is reinforced by all of many of his other values. <coughs> Suppose it's very deeply reinforced. And so if behind the way of ignorance I say, well, I, for, I might be, I imagine myself to be a Christian whose values are not only held in the Ulysses and the Sirens like way, but they are highly reinforced. Right? In the way that I was suggesting, so they are rational as well. Now, in order for the impasse to continue, Rawls would have to, the, the, the liberal would have to say that his commitment to non-interference is deeply reinforced by these. But he can't say that, because these values are what he doesn't know. Right? They are withheld from his, his moral psychology. So this value is out on a limb by the nature of the project. Right? So what Rawls will have to do against the person who, behind the veil of ignorance, imagines himself not only to be committed to Christianity and to it being reinforced, he can't, Rawls can't say, I'm continuing this impasse by saying my commitment to being unimpeded and not interfered with is supported by my subject values because that's not available to me. So, Rawls, in a way, can't ask you to be a liberal without asking you to be weak willed. Because he doesn't have the privilege of asking for substantive support from the substantive values through reinforcement. So if he says, you must nevertheless choose the first principle, given the way I've set up the moral psychology of the identitarian, and given Rawls's project, he's not only going to be 
or suffering under an impasse with the different, he's going to lose. Because he's going to say, if he says you must choose liberalism, he's asking you to be addicted to liberalism. Because that's what we could, the addicts are we could. The unwilling addict is we could. So he's basically asking us to be liberals in the form of an addiction, a weak willed commitment, given the moral psychology that I've set up. Right? So he, the, the liberal always loses. So a lot of work needs to be done. And the second part of my essay basically tries to argue. I, I better start. I think I've gone on for two. So the, the second part of the, the essay basically argues for how, ask the question whether relativism follows from this moral psychology, which repudiates the standard liberal line of argument from mere Torrance and Archer. And, and I don't believe that it does, but that's a long uh, story, and it's uh, worth talking about. I'd be happy to talk about it when, after the day. Thank you very much. of the discussion and elevation of the importance of internal reasons, which I find very appealing before moving on to raise some questions about Akil's conception of identity, the implications of jettisoning, of, uh, the implications of jet jet jettisoning external reasons to relativism, and perhaps in the end, the question of two about liberalism. Following, Akil, uh, following Bernard Williams, Akil contends that internal reasons understood as something in one's motivational set when modified, as he has done, as he does in the paper, uh, with the idea of reinforcement, are fully adequate as a source of explaining the rationality and normativity of human behavior. Understood as such, Akil, like Williams, wants to claim that we can view and understand human beings as intentional <clears throat> moral subjects who have reasons for acting without those reasons being external to their moral economy. This is an enormously important idea in part because it liberates us from having to subscribe to a singular form of moral rationality in the absence of which, so the familiar argument goes, we would be consigned to a nihilistic hell or Babelian chaos. In, this specific, in its specifically political implications, Akil discusses Mill and Rawls, 
It is an argument that withdraws many of the crucial supports to the edifice of modern, both liberal and non-liberal political thought, while establishing that despite this withdrawal, much of the edifice is still left standing, or at any rate, it can be reconstructed on the basis of internal reasons. Historically, one might see this argument about internal reasons <coughs> as giving succor to those liberal traditions in the 17th century which lost out to Hobbes and the members of the Royal Society <coughs> when they established, uh, 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 and the members of the Royal established, uh, when they established what came to be the triumph of a hegemonic and singular conception of reason, political rationality, and morality. In another register, it is an idea that vindicates the thought that culture matters, not just, in the not just as the ground of collective behavior, but also in giving individuals reasons for acting with moral purpose. Finally, one might say, it is an idea that recalls that minor key of Kant's thinking, minor because Kant made it so, in which his purpose was to, quote, deny knowledge to make room for faith. I find the idea of internal reasons and the emphasis that Akil wants to place on it very appealing. Because, to put it simply, or perhaps crudely, it democratizes the basis of having reasons and being moral. In contrast, for example, in contrast, for example, Mill anchors his main argument for free speech in a singular external conception of rationality and hence has very little difficulty justifying a regime of imperial tutelage for those he deems to be not yet equipped with that rationality. In Akil <clears throat> and my preferred world, there is a plethora of reasons and value commitments, and that, that, uh, 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 there is a plethora of reasons and value commitments that they sanction. In the words of the poet Mark Ward, we all have reasons for moving. And now I paraphrase uh, Mark Ward, we all move to keep things whole, that is to say, keep things moral. But here is where the story gets complicated. If internal reasons are the only reasons we really have and act on, because those are the kinds of reasons uh, in our motivational set, they are also the only reasons that we can bring to bear on deep disagreements that necessarily follow from our various value commitments. Deprived as we are of external normative rational standards to adjudicate these differences, we have arrived, have we arrived at an abyss of moral relativism? Akil thinks not, I'm less sure. I'm leaving aside the issue of the relativism as a doctrine of truth, which he also discusses and says very interesting. At any rate, I'm not clear what Akil means by avoiding relativism. But first, let me explain what, in Akil's view, are the resources available in a situation in which each of the disagreeing parties affirms their disparate value commitments and reasons. The basic idea is that even though each party inhabits a world with only internal reasons, these reasons are not without their own conflict or tension for those who are motivated by them. We are not, as Akil rightly points out, monsters of coherence or rational automata. We are subjects in history, and hence our built in uh, and hence our best built enclosures and fortifications are not immune from the Hegelian winds of transformation, including self transformation. Our lives are seldom, never really maximally reinforced to the degree that, just, that, that we can just live through, uh, live as though we were not in history. Those changes, which new information and new contexts, along with internal conflicts and tensions bring, transform our moral and psychological economies. They allow disagreeing parties to give each other internal reasons to change in one direction rather than another. Because of this predicament, which one might call historically induced conviviality, that is, that is the giving of internal reasons despite the deep disagreements, Akil believes, and now I quote, 
there is no reason to think relativism follows upon the loss of external reasons, and so no reason to be pessimistic about the scope of internal reasons to be a resource for liberal political outcomes. End of quote. <coughs> he, also, he, he believes this despite also believing that there is, and I could give quote again, no Whiggish guarantee of a liberal consummation of the historical process in a liberal outcome. End of quote. I find these claims surprising. After all, what the claim about being subjects in history and internal conflict left us with was that each side could and should give the other side internal reasons for modifying their positions when, fi when faced with these, these disagreements. But, but is this more than saying, because we are subjects in history and because our value commitments will net will never be entirely self-confirming and self-sustaining because we are not maximally reinforced or monsters of coherence. We will therefore always have reasons for talking to each other and trying to persuade each other. The liberal trying to persuade the illiberal and presumably vice versa. For, for the classical liberal, like Mill and Rawls, and for the Hegelian liberal, there is, after all, if not grounds for pessimism, at least a sense of having lost something in this situation of ongoing conversation. The former, that is, Mill and Rawls, have lost the advantage offered by the conviction in an appeal to external reasons, since now, presumably, he might find his internal conflicts deployed against him by his illiberal opponent. And for the Hegelian liberal, there is, in, there is <coughs> the, the fact that history may not end up where he thinks it should end up, that is, in a liberal, liberal constitutional monarchy. My point is that in a world in which all we can do is to try and persuade each other with internal reasons, and where, moreover, there is no assured historical trajectory, anchored as it is in Hegel in the most ex external of reasons, namely, Geist, the story could indeed turn out in all sorts of weird ways. That prospect should give liberals ground for pessimism, since they have nothing better than their opponents. A conversation of humankind, as Oakeshott and Rorty put it, it is a, kind of a conversation uh, uh, of humankind, as Oakeshott and Rorty put it. I find that to be a rather appealing prospect, especially if someone <coughs> Could somehow, especially if somehow one could get war and violence from not interfering with that conversation. But what is not clear to me is how the situation just described, described relates to the issue of relativism. As I understand it, what we have is a situation in which each side can always give the other side reasons, internal reasons, for altering their extant value commitments. There is no presumptive advantage on either side for the liberal or the illiberal position. Each has their moral universes and internal reasons that support them. And because of, the, because of various reasons, despite these differences in value commitments, they can nevertheless engage each other. There is no historical tilt in the situation the way there is in the Marxian or Hegelian or Whig account of history. The dice is not loaded. We, are therefore, we therefore have no abstract reason for believing that one set of moral values or commitments will prevail. So why are we not, so why are we not in a situation that, <coughs> that, altogether, that is altogether different to, a, to a, uh, that, that is altogether indifferent to the issue of relativism? Or why aren't we in that predicament about which it is correct? as a description to say, relativism, relativism now, and perhaps even in the future. Akil clearly believes that the loss of external reasons does not imply the presence of relativism. But that, does he mean by that simply that the conversation continues? And for that reason, there is no cause to be, and because of that, there is no cause <coughs> for deep or nihilistic despair the sort of thing often associated with relativism. Berlin, as if I understand him, 
for that because diverse value commitments were worlds unto themselves, in his words, they were incommensurate, he could only affirm a kind of sub subjective and tragic commitment to his own liberalism. Because, as he says, value commitments are essentially and irredeemably relative. I understand Akil's disagreement with Berlin, who was a pluralist and, even though he didn't often acknowledge it, a relativist, because he saw value commitments as quarantined from each other. Akil thinks these worlds can engage with each other, but it's not clear to me what this engagement has to do with relativism. Now, I want to conclude by asking a few questions. Uh, uh, and the first question I want to ask is about Akil's conception of identity. I understand, let me remind you what the conception of identity is. This is from Identity is a fundamental value commitment, uh, a fundamental value commitment as a value commitment constitutes the identity of a person or group if its possessor wants it satisfied even if they were not to have that value commitment. Now, I understand the notion uh, in much of the social science lit literature, this is referred to as the issue of pre-commitment. Um, it's played a huge role in uh, constitutionalism, played a huge role in, in constitutionalism um, that a lot of people in this, uh, in the American Academy were involved in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and as Akeem says, you know, it's, it's evident in, in both liberal constitutionalism and uh, uh, in Khomeini. Uh, now, I guess the question I have is, um, uh, on this view of identity, um, uh, Oh, 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 what I have difficulty uh, with is connecting this view of identity with the more prosaic form of identity politics that one has seen a proliferation of. Because it seems to me a conspicuous feature of that identity politics is not the sort of pre-commitment that Akil is talking about. In fact, it's it's a deploying of identity as something utterly mobile and utterly reactive, not as something which one is committed to, even committed to in a particular way, so as to include the anticipation of a time when one might not be committed to it. So I'm thinking, for instance, of the comment uh, Hannah Arendt made when she says, um, if you're attacked as a Jew, you fight back as a Jew. The idea being that, look, my identity here is being constituted entirely contextually, not in the sort of way that Achillism uh, uh, understands identity. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, uh, my question is really, uh, uh, it's a difficulty uh, linking Akil's conception of identity with the more prosaic form of it. Um, uh, and also, I guess uh, I'm struck by the fact that um, uh, people who claim identity do so um, uh, in a way that is uh, very different than uh, the way Akeem understands the term. So, you know, I, I have no difficulty saying um, uh, um, I am an Indian. Uh, without in any way uh, suggesting that I'm an Indian in the way that, uh, so, so there is a cognitive sense
sense in which when I say I am an Indian, I am expressing a claim about an identity I have. And yet that identity is not at all captured by, 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 by Akil's conception of identity. And so this is really just a question of, you know, can one use this, this conception of identity uh, in, in some sense uh, make sense of the way in which most of us use the term identity uh, without, without having to say, well, actually, most people don't have identities because they don't have them in this form. One final question, uh, and this is, again, a kind of, uh, it's a question that's quite external to the paper. Uh, but, uh, um, or the framework of the paper. Uh, Akil identifies liberalism uh, by this sort of a sentence, or this sort of a commitment, where Mill uh, says uh, something to the effect that, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, um, Liberals have a certain commitment to non-interfering, uh, not interfering with uh, 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 substantive values, um, and, and that's the way in which um, uh, something like free speech gets the elevated status that it does. Now, I guess what what uh, uh, troubles me is, and this is. To the extent uh, here I'm influenced by, by Raymond Boyce's work, I'm not sure this is the way to think about, or this is a good way to think about liberalism in terms of this kind of what 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 <coughs> what uh, uh, he calls this singular slogan that defines liberalism. Uh, Liberalism, as I understand it, um, well, uh, even if one stays with with uh, with this proposition, I mean, we happen to know that Mill himself said the proposition uh, uh, could be suspended. So he says he says there are conditions under which uh, this proposition doesn't apply. The principle of liberty doesn't. Right. So he says, under conditions of war, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply under conditions of crisis. Um, uh, um, which would, so one could square that by saying, well, Mill himself is not always committed to liberalism. Um, uh, but the, the broader methodological point I'm interested in, or I'm, uh, I'm asking uh, you to think aloud about is, you know, what might be uh, a kind of methodological way, a methodologically rich way to think about liberalism, which might also capture some of its kind of complex history, which it seems to me this form of thinking about liberalism doesn't capture. And that, I take it, is the kind of broad thrust of somebody like Raymond Boyce's, uh, you know, recent critiques of kind of contemporary analytical political philosophy that, it, in some sense, uh, the claim being that it doesn't adequately illuminate uh, the world that we live in. Now, having said that, I know enough of Akil's work, but that's certainly not true of Akil's work. But I wonder if this way of Kind of characterizing liberalism actually, uh, in some sense, does something else. That's all. Thank you.